So, mm-hmm. so you go to uni oh, yeah. at the University of Utah. So I you submit to, you commit yourself. Yeah, and so just a little insight. I'm still messaging too. So she's still messaging me and still like it's it's definitely like that push and pull thing where it's like she misses me, she wants me, I'm bad for her, I remind her of her abusers, like I'm a bad person, I trigger her and oh, and the other thing she would like have multiple personalities and I'm not sure if it's an act or a real thing, but it would definitely never happen around other people. She'd never have a seizure around guests. She would never have a seizure or, you know, multiple personalities around guests. It was only in public. I mean, something that should have totally triggered and traumatized her. Like if glass broke, she would just be on the floor, but like no one, maybe, maybe Blake and Mark have seen, I've never seen her actually fall over and seize. I've only heard like a thump and then look, and then somehow she's there, but I always felt her head and she never had any bumps that I could feel, but maybe she did. I don't know. I, I don't know. So the idea, about. what I'm hearing you say is that maybe she used this, she Good feigned attention. multiple personality disorder to manipulate her close followers, Yes, which would, which would fall, fall in line with the borderline personality diagnosis. Yeah. But then somehow magically, whenever someone with money or someone with influence or some external person was around, it would never happen. Disappear, never happen, everything. So highly manipulative. Uh, that's, that's what it seemed like to me. And if she really has those things, hey, I'm really sorry and I wish you the best. But it just appears like you were putting on a huge show. Okay, so. okay. So she's texting you after you go to uni. Yeah, so I, so I kind of like, yeah, embellished to get in there because I wanted to see what kind of treatment they could give me or whatever. But not really, but like, anyways, it was kind of weird. Why uni? Why'd you go there? You were the psychiatric. Thought you were... I thought it was crazy. I mean, okay, I thought okay. it was like a, I mean, like something. I mean, she says to kill myself and then she's like, don't go in there. And then like, they take me back and it's like kind of a drama thing. But um, I go in there and I just, it's pretty horrible. I don't know if anyone's been there, but it's not a very fun place. I, I have to jump in. I, I have a friend that works at uni. I have a someone close to me who feels like their life was saved at uni. So oh, I don't, I don't want like your experience is your experience and yeah. you felt the things you felt and not, no intervention is ever going to be beneficial and healthy to everyone. It's just going to, yeah. but I, but I do know that if you're feeling like you want to end your life um, and you're really close to yeah. ending it, call 911, commit right yourself to yeah. a, a local psychiatric ward, a hospital, because they can save your life. They can yeah. get you on psychiatric medication. They can stabilize you. They can get you mental health professionals. And yeah, it's not going to be a fun experience because everyone in there is locked up and there are controls and it's, it's a sad, in many ways it's, it can be a sad and tragic place, but I, I want to allow you to have your experience and I don't want people to feel like these places can't be helpful because they absolutely can be the last resort for people that otherwise are going to end their lives and not exist anymore. Thank you. And I agree 100%. And I feel that everyone's life, like my experience in Mormonism is something completely different than another person's. And that could literally save their life. And like, like counseling therapy can be terrible for one person and can literally save their life. And so, yeah, I definitely, I think a lot of people in the new age stuff are very scared of medicine and psychologists and therapists. And I would just encourage them to try, try to find a counselor they like, try to do something you know, don't give up on medicine and science just because you've had a bad experience. So, yeah. Okay. So you, sub- you committed yourself there Yeah. and she was texting you and what happened? Um, yeah, she kept texting me and then I left and then I lived with my mom for a little bit and then I lived with my dad. And then I was just, I was just out of it. I was still eating like raw food and, and I would just like pace and twitch a lot and uh, think for hours, like trying to figure everything out, trying to figure out the things that she had taught and try to put them together in my world view. Cause she said, you know, just do whatever makes you happy and everything will work out. And I was trying to do whatever was making me happy, but really I was being a burden on all the people around me and it didn't really make me happy. It was just momentary, like pleasure, you know, watching a TV show or masturbating or eating chocolate or whatever. And like, there's so much more that brings happiness than just follow your bliss. So hard work pays off working on things are satisfying, spending time, you know, investing in things and relationships really helps. So I just think that a lot of the things she said were just completely false. And I think it's awesome. Some of it's like obvious common sense. And then some of it's like, 
false. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a combination. Yeah, and she would look up something. She'd think of a topic. I'm going to talk about women's rights, and she'd look up a bunch of stuff and, uh, you know, Google a bunch of crap and steal stuff from other people, print out a thing in a couple hours, record it, and then Blake would put a bunch of cool pictures in there and make it all look cool. And so, like, you know, and that, you know, Joseph Smith, they, they say that so much of what he created in Scripture or his revelations were all inspired by Swedenborg or View of the Hebrews or yeah, Alexander Campbell. Like, Joseph Smith, those who kind of have really tried to understand his life, recognize that he was just a sponge of all the stuff that was culturally around him. You know, Adam Clark's commentary on the Bible becomes the Joseph Smith translation of the New Testament. Like, the View of the Hebrews becomes the Book of Mormon, you know, like— so you're saying that she was a sponge and that her videos were just basically products of her Googling stuff, reading stuff, oh, writing, yeah. writing would, it up and then making a cool slick video and then having a guy make it look good. Yeah, I'd give her lots of good ideas and she would use them in videos. Okay. Like, I don't know, 10 or more of all ideas that I had and she'd just go and take them and run with them. And I thought it was cool. I was trying to help make the world a better place and... So you're living alone, looks, you're, you're oh. going crazy, you're eating chocolate, uh, you know, tr watching your yeah. videos, trying to kind of get well, yeah. right? And, and so what happened? There's two questions I have. At what? How did you get better? And then at what point did you start not believing in her anymore? Okay, so I was sick. So I went back to St. George. I was working and I was still just like really hurting and really screwed up and uh, really ill. And I went back to my dad's house again for a second time and I was not working at that time. And he encouraged me to get a job Then I got a great job. And, uh, and you know, he's like, you got to get out of the house because I was living there for months without doing anything. And I'm so glad they did that. And then I actually turned on them and said all this horrible stuff to my dad and just like outlashed him at him. On your parents. Yeah. Any idea why you did that? Uh, I was not well. I mean, like, I think there are some just really mean, twisted things I said to him. And he just said, Jared, you're not well. And that is after I'd moved out of the house. And, and were they still believing Mormons at this point? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're very nice people. We've since ended the, the relationship, but they're just so forgiving. You're not so close to them? Oh, it mended the relationship. Oh, you have mended the relationship. Oh. Yeah. There's something about being, uh, when someone gives you something, it can create contempt. So even though you're the recipient of significant charity and support, there's a part of you inside that probably feels guilty that you needed that support to begin with. Oh, yeah. And I think there's a degree to which you lash out at those who help you most out of shame that you needed their help to begin with. Exactly. And resentment. Is that possible? Yeah. And I like to apologize to my mother and father and stepfather and stepmother because that was, yeah, it was horrible. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I have since, but, you know. So he so, kicks you out, you get a job. Yep, I live in a place, and um, and then I move back to St. George after a while and working and living in a basement apartment all by myself. And Well, I actually live with my mom first, and then I live with a family that they rented a room, and that was a really fun time, great people. And then I, um, the Busbies, yeah, shout out to the Busbies, those guys, um, then I uh, moved into my own apartment and, you know, fought to get my daughter back as far as, like, being able to sleep over. That was part of the – I just signed over, you know, whatever she wanted. And then I got the that. divorce. Yeah, and then I changed it. To get rights to see your daughter. Yeah. Visitation I mean, rights. I had, like, day rights, but I wanted, like, an entire visitation weekend. Visitation rights, yeah. yeah. But better visitation rights. So then after that, I uh, – I kept trying to work on myself. By the way, that's another sign of a cult is to isolate you from your family, separate you from your family. And you were estranged. It sounds like you were largely estranged from your daughter. So yeah. reuniting with her, what a wonderful thing. I'm so happy for you both. Yeah. Yeah. She's been definitely had some sad times. I had moved back there after the cult and then I'd moved away from her and I'd done that seemed like a couple of times. So I'm sure she was very confused by that. We've tried to talk about it, but. It's definitely very sad, but uh, it's better now. We laugh a lot. How old is she? She's eleven now. Okay, yeah. It's been years. So okay. Um, so, so you get your daughter back. Yeah, and I'm still really sick. I feel like um, I think the biggest help has been moving out of the basement, living with my brother. 
It's helped a lot living around people, socializing more, and then making sure that I eat enough and well. So you changed your diet yeah. to what? Just. What do you eat now? Uh, meat, vegetables, grains, B vitamins, all the things that I needed. And your health has improved since changing yeah, your diet? my mind has improved too. Like I feel a lot. I haven't eaten anything today, so that's like I kind of seem dry and <laughs> out of it, but. Yeah. So. And, and again, a sign of a cult is dietary restrictions. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's just true. So, um, okay. So you start eating better. You start being with your daughter. What about your beliefs? When did they change? And when did you start sort of saying, maybe she's not, maybe I was in a cult. Maybe. How did that realization come to you? Um, watching, like I said, the master. And okay. So, so keep talking about that. Go back to that. So, so it's a movie where this troubled man like finds someone who brings him in and takes him into the family and it's this guy that's just like willing he's are obviously like it mentally ill as it is and he's just willing to do anything for the master and he, they even go and beat up some people and stuff like that thankfully i never did anything like that but i definitely would have she said what's the craziest when i was with her teal says what's the craziest thing you'd ever do for me and i said i'd kill someone and bury them in the backyard and i meant she like that oh yeah i mean well Maybe she might have said that was messed up or crazy, but it's she, I mean. She you felt was, like she liked that devotion. Yeah. yeah. And again, uh, what's the movie called? The Master. The Master is, is Philip Seymour Hoffman plays the L. Ron Hubbard character. Is it Joaquin Phoenix who plays the, yeah, he does the follower? Such a good job. He's so good. And it's basically loosely based on the foundation of Scientology. And so you watch that movie and then what happened? I was like, just like, whoa, like. That's got to be, I mean, like, I started to watch more and more television movies, and the more experiences I had and see things like that, I could see that, like, okay, this was an abusive relationship. This wasn't right. She has the signs of a cult leader. You know, whether or not that was actually a cult or a communal family that was just really abusive, I don't really know all the details. It seems like it was a cult to me. and It seems like a dangerous place to be. But... um and the more people I tell about the experiences, them some people be like, "Oh, what is that?" And then they start to watch the videos, and then they really start to like her because she's very charismatic, and the videos are kind of entertaining and kind of talk a little bit about everything and get you thinking about things differently. And I think that can be very fun for people when they haven't had anything else or anyone else to rely on in their life. But yeah, I mean, as long as you don't move in with her, I guess, or really believe anything she says is t too much truth. So by watching those videos, you started to question oh, her yeah. and, and make sense of your experience. Yeah. Was there anything else in your journey or that's it? And then you just stopped believing or? Yeah. I mean. Uh, when did that contact end with her? Um, I was still trying to get to like heal her, help her. I think a couple years later, cause I'd figured out like what I deemed to be the solution to everything, which is that we are the solution to our own problems. Like literally our bodies and our minds are made in a way so that we, if we th like focus and put the attention back on us, like we can solve it, give ourselves like and true enlightenment is like self confidence. It's believing in yourself and the ability to solve your own problems. And the more Not an external source. Exactly. An intrinsic internal source. Exactly. And the more you put your focus and your belief back there, the stronger your self-confidence grows. The more you take ownership. I got out of there. I did this. I made this. This is my life. And you don't give it to something external because our brains are like, you know, neural pathways. Once we forge a trail, we can get there faster and faster. And every time we go down that path until one day we can just look at something and go down a path like a mile long and end up somewhere that we didn't want to be. And that's, we can reprogram ourselves just by simply reminding ourselves, I can fix that. I can change that. And the more we reaffirm ourselves, and that's what I started doing was I was sitting there on the couch, like shaking and twitching, thinking that I had buried dead bodies in Houston. And my dad was, I'd lock my door every night because I thought my dad was like a serial killer. And I was so like confused and scared. And I just remember like thinking that like, okay, if I just put Instead of putting it on an intrinsic thing like, you know, this medicine or this crystal or this meditation or this thing or God or whoever, if I just put it on myself and give myself enough time and change my focus, I bet I could heal myself. And so that's what I did is I just kept thinking that, like, give myself more and more self-confidence. And now I'm at the point where, like, I mean, I'd lost my house and I've gotten tons of debt. I paid off a lot of debt and I still got more to go. But I've gotten to where I'm at now 
that I have a job, I have a car, I pay rent, I buy my own food, like I'm no longer a loaf, like I'm, I've changed who I am. And I've done that. And I've changed the way I thought, like I no longer believe in aliens or spirit. I mean, there could be, you know what I mean? I don't know what's out there, but I don't know. I don't, I'm not wrapped up in anything or any way of thinking that like I have to do this or else bad things are going to happen to me. And it's been really nice. What about the special powers me. stuff? Like crystals have special powers, Reiki has yeah, special powers. What about things. that? Yeah. Diet has special powers. No. You're not believing in that stuff no. anymore. No, thank you. And that's been good for you. Yeah, it's been great. Why? Because I realized that all of these things can be like a smorgasbord, like a buffet. You just get to, if you're happy and confident in who you are, all these things that you try on can just be for fun. But when you're desperate, the things that you're trying on are like additional burdens that are weighing you down in order to try to become a better person. Like I have to do this. And people that force themselves to do things immediately try to force other people to do them. We're such like, like parrots or whatever we are. Like if we're forcing ourselves to be vegan, we're going to talk about it and try to force everyone else to do it or do this or that. And uh, just, I don't know why we do that. But. So you basically... And, you know, it's it's weird because you read Jesus' teachings. He says the kingdom of God is within, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, what I like to think is that whoever Jesus was, he's basically saying the power's in you. It's not outside. Yeah, exactly. Stop looking outside for exactly. the source of power. And anyone who's a teacher worth listening to, I think, is not going to be saying the power's in crystals, the power's in Reiki, the power's in me, the power's in, you know, they're, they're going to say the power's in you, period. I think. And you're saying that's where you found health and healing is when you stopped looking outside for a source of power. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's been such a blessing. And I just think like some of the things that I've learned over life, is that okay to share about that? Yeah. Yeah. The things I've learned is like, the first one is like, you know, James Taylor says it best in his song, shower the people. He says the moment you share with someone the way that you feel, I think something like that, the feeling begins to ease. And that's like the biggest thing that I wish I would have learned is that you don't have to contain everything inside and you can share it in such a kind way. And like, you can just say to your partner, I feel inadequate in bed, or I feel angry that you were talking with that person. I feel, you just say these, I feel statements and you can transform your relationship in your life so quickly. Like be vulnerable at work. I feel over overwhelmed. I feel like I'm not doing a good job. You share people how you're feeling instead of getting on the defensive and the attack and all these things. And it's going to be just such a simple life transformation, transforming thing is to, to share that. And then the other, the other technique that I learned, I've, there's like all these little, and I don't know how sketchy this is as far as psychology goes, but like, there's these little things where, um, like emotional freedom technique, like tapping and stuff like that. I found that like, if I go to a feeling like people think like there's, you, you've gone on this life journey. You packed up all these bags and you've, you have all this trauma and drama and this sadness for all these things. And you're just like, what do you do with them? And I just, my, the thing that helped me, and I hope it might help you is to just to feel them, to go wherever you're at, sit wherever you can and just start feeling all your feelings and feel all the ones that you just try to keep at bay and just slowly tap on your head and say everything you need to say and get it all out because you think that this rage, this burning, this anger, whatever is inside of you is going to last forever, but it won't. I mean, maximum of five minutes. I mean, I can't, I mean, you can cry and scream and you look at the clock and it's like three minutes, 40 seconds. You're like, wow. Like you, it feels like it's forever, but you went through all the journey. You have all the baggage and that's how you can unpack it. It's a simple technique. You feel the feeling and you just like whenever I get triggered or upset, that's what I do. I'll sit there and just, I tap on my head. I don't know why that comforts me and I don't know if it will help anyone, but that's just what I've learned. I, I would just say it's kind of like a grounding technique. It, you know, when you do guided meditation, tapping, putting your feet on the floor, whatever it is, it's or basically just a way to ground yourself in reality okay. to, to bring yourself back to the present moment. Yeah, okay. And so as long as you're not trying to say it has some metaphysical no. spiritual power, no. but it's just a physical technique that sort of yeah, grounds so you, makes, puts you in the present moment and helps you be more mindful of what you're experiencing. Yeah. Yeah. It helps. Great. Me, it helps dissipate the emotion for me. I don't know what it's it, doing. It's an yeah, emotional grounded. release. Oh yeah. Great. Great. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's been like the hugest thing. And so, and then, but along with vulnerability and expression of emotion, instead of, you know, you talked about in your first marriage being passive aggressive, oh, yeah. not being aware of your emotions, exactly, not expressing your emotions exactly. and then being just a, a disaster to everyone around you. Exactly. You're saying become aware of your emotions, articulate them, share them, be vulnerable mm -hmm. and Find then solutions. grow in with emotional intimacy 
your your relationships will grow. Exactly. And and that's it's so yeah, it's just so beautiful that you you don't have to like do drastic things in order to improve your life. We all think it's like, oh, if I run away from this person or if I leave this job or, you know, if I do this thing, like that's not it. You can improve your life right here and now. And it starts by saying with the biggest problem, what is the biggest problem in your life? Say it. And then what's the pain behind it? So a lot of times we'll have like these emotional walls where we'll feel one thing and we'll feel it all the time, like anger, like this rage and rage and we tap and we feel it all the time. But really it's a wall on a front to cover another emotion. And there's an engineering, my brother was telling me because we were talking about this the other day that there's like the five whys you got to ask yourself why and why and why and why and usually like it's more than five and like when they're trying to diagnose a problem sorry I'm like all over the place as you can see but they're trying to diagnose the problem they ask why is the engine not working well the fuel pumps not working. why is the fuel in the pump not working it's the battery why is the battery not working because this cable's off so you can find all these issues by asking why and that's it's the troubleshooting same, troubleshooting yeah. yeah and you yeah. can figure it out within yourself by doing the same thing yeah and that's actually very consistent with with psychology you know th they say that anger is a secondary emotion okay. that there's almost always fear or um sadness mm -hmm. Uh, behind the anger. Oh, good. <laughs> and so if you get under the anger, you'll say, well, I'm sad about this, or I'm hurt. Mm -hmm. Hurt is another one. So if someone hurt me, I'm mm -hmm. sad, or I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. And if and if you do the work to lean into your anger and see what it's about, you do that troubleshooting, you find out, oh my gosh, I'm actually just afraid, or I'm feeling inadequate, or I'm feeling sad. And once you get to the primary emotions, you talk it out with people, you can address them, exactly. solve the problem, and exactly. then the anger goes away. But it's not by just saying anger is bad, I need to not be angry. Exactly, and try to and hold it in And you hold it in, and then it's, then it's just blowing up all, all over the place because you never actually fix the problem. Yeah, yeah, or you're just like, I'm not angry. I just really wish you would do this. You're know, like <laughs> your, your passive-aggressive nightmare. And yeah. so, yeah. Anyways, that's like – that's the biggest things I've learned in life. And that's really helped me. It's just to be honest, even with my daughter or whoever, it's like, I'm angry. I was like, she asked for ice cream and I get mad at her. And she's like, why, you know, okay. I feel like I'm being a bad dad because I've let you have so many ice cream today, so much ice cream today. And so I'm taking it out on you and that's not right. And I just, it's processing and going through your emotions and just saying, I just, I feel, I mean, it just changed my life. So mm, I feel, I love it. Thanks. So, um, Teal Swan is still doing her thing. Like I, I read this BBC article. She had these big Facebook groups with all these followers, all this suicide stuff came out. And so then like Facebook shut down one of her Facebook groups. And then another one like called Phoenix got recreated by one of her acolytes. And, you know, she's doing events all over the world. Her YouTube channel has tens of millions of views at this point, like 600,000, 700,000 followers. Like, She's a she's becoming a bigger and a bigger deal. And by the way, I put out a call on Facebook. Do any of the, my listeners or friends, you know, know about her? And a lot of people knew about her. Um, a lot of people didn't, but a lot of people did. And then a subset of those people are like, oh, I really like what she has to say. And, oh, she teaches some really cool things. And I disagree with her here and there, but generally I really like her. And so, like, she's got a lot of, like, you've told us the backstory of what's really going on. And yet all the people that just see these cool videos think she's amazing and, and follow her. I don't think that's like, I don't think this, that's the only occurrence of that. I think a lot of people in fame can be that way. I'm, they're just like. It's not just her. You're saying yeah, it's Julie I Rowe, like, it's Denver Snuffer. It's, yeah. I mean, a lot of people are nightmares behind closed doors. I mean, there's stories and accounts of famous people and people on talk shows and all sorts of people that are just absolute nightmares behind closed doors. And there's even video of such things. And so I think that they're probably forcing themselves to do things in order to get a lot of love and attention because of how horrible they feel inside. I don't know, right. but I think it's, I mean, if that's what she wants to devote her life to, I mean, all power to her. Even if that helps someone in any way, great, you know, I just so. But as you're thinking about your experience and you, you know, you've used the word cult yourself, mm -hmm. there's gotta be a, a close ring of people around her and there's gotta be other people that might be vulnerable to the same types of things you were vulnerable to. So how do you, as you're watching her popularity and presence grow, yeah. um, as you've acknowledged that from your perspective, it probably was a cult, there might be other people getting hurt. And I mean, that's gotta be part of why you're doing this interview, right? So to I get think- get the word out, to educate people, to tell people what it's really like or not? No, because 
you can't, I don't think you can hold pain and do good. You can't feel bad for someone and do good. I think it always has a horrible outcome. So you can't be so worried about someone's a potentiality of joining a cult because they're going to do it no matter what. Right. And if you try to stop them, it's going to be more traumatic. They may traumatic do it more. And then, they yeah. may do it. Be more, the yes. fire, fire effect. Yeah. They so, may be more motivated if you don't join a cult. You know? Yeah. If, if I felt. Get away really, from her. You know? Yeah, exactly. If I enjoyed like, like destroying every one of her videos or enjoyed like tearing apart all her logic or lack of it and all sorts of stuff. Then you're sick. Well, no, not that I'm sick. If I enjoyed doing that, then I would, but I don't enjoy doing that. Oh, okay. Because if it was something, I feel that everyone needs to do exactly what they really enjoy for the right reasons, because they can say they enjoy something and they want to do something, but it's for the wrong reasons because they're laced in pain and fear. But if it's something truly in them, then I think they should do it and it will be funny. It will be enjoyable. It'll be whatever. It'll be whatever like, it is. It, yeah, it'll be whatever it is. And, and I think that's the best thing that people can do is embrace who they are. And I, even people that are like, for some reason they want to kill as horrible as that is there's places and outlets for these type of terrible things you can become you can work at a slaughterhouse you could join the army and go shoot people like there's always an, a place for you and you've got to instead of trying to hide and pretend those feelings and things don't exist you've got to find healthy outlets for who you are and i think that's that's where true happiness and health comes in is embracing who you are and finding a way to to live in our society so so, um, and so you're not feeling like it's your job to warn people of her and, and take, take people, no, take away her, her followers and all that. Yeah. I totally believe everyone's like, cause the only problem that, like I said, the only thing that causes evil is feeling so bad for something that you're held hostage in order to do something. If you feel genuinely that you want to do this and it's fun and it's enjoyable, that's great. But if you're feeling like this is the only way. And if you don't do it like or something, that's when it gets scary because that's when you're like you get so amped up and so like driven that you'll be willing to do anything at all cost. And that's where it gets scary. And that's where the cult stuff comes in to me. And is and Holly, one of our listeners, she makes the point. She says challenging someone's beliefs rarely changes their viewpoint. It's pointless. And I would even add to that. It usually makes them believe double down and believe more. Yeah. So you're, you're you're what you're saying is something I think really intelligent, which is. You're not doing this to tear down Teal Swan or to convince her followers not to follow her. Mm. And yet I think you probably believe that that there may be people hurt by her and that there may be people who are vulnerable, especially, again, these, these you know, kind of these suicide teachings. Who, who knows if, the, you know, that has influenced people. And so how do you reconcile that? Well, it's just, it's just, it's yeah, just you can't. If you're feeling like, yeah, I just, I'm like a broken record. If you feel, if you went through something, every two people can go through the same experience. So two people can go on a roller coaster ride. One gets off, thought they're going to die. It was worst experience of their life. And another one had a blast. And so it's, I'm, I'm, I know it's like, we're getting about sensitive subject, but I mean, like some people could really think, wow, you know, her telling me to kill myself really opened up my eyes and really wanted me to change my life. And that yeah, was an amazing that's thing. Right, yeah. So any two events can make that way. And I feel like everything I went through was a blessing. Why? Because I see it with more loving and compassion eyes and more joy and more humor than in the past. Mm. I'm not holding pain. And so again, the root of all evil is holding pain for is not forgiving for me. Yeah. I mean like holding that's where pain and not forgiving that that's the same concept. It's like where you embody someone's pain. So like people try to get you to hold pain and it's like pain sharing, like in a group. So like say we're a group or we're, we're now in a group of people talking about anything and we're just saying, how dare you disrespect this person? You need to understand what they went through. They're trying to share pain and get you to embody it. And if they can, they can now manipulate you and control you with that pain. And that's what happens inside the cult. Teal has gone through so much. How could you ever say that? How could you ever do that? And so it's all about like trying to prevent her from her pain, from everything she's gone through. It's like, and you know, safety netting her from types of food, safety netting her from types of people, all sorts of things. And so that's to me... Yeah, again, like whenever someone's getting you to feel that and to like, this is more important. Like, how dare you disrespect? They talk that way. They're, they're pain sharing, they're pain forcing. They're trying to get you to, they're trying to get you to get, feel bad for something. And that's bullshit. You should never, ever follow that because that will always lead to disaster and destruction and evil because you're holding pain. And when you feel bad, 
you think bad and you choose thoughts from a bad place. When you feel good, you think good and you choose thoughts from a good place. And so that's, I mean, you can create a cult out of the office, at work, anywhere, anywhere can someone like a bully or someone can get you to feel bad enough in order to make you control you. And that's where the heart of all abusive relationships is the heart of everything is like that pain. And that's my belief. I don't know so the two, the two the two things are getting people to hold pain, and then what was the second thing? You you can manipulate them with it. So manipulating let's, them with that once pain. you've enraged them, basically. Yeah. Okay. So you know these people are hurting animals. Like so let's so usually we vegans. We, yeah. So we usually trigger people with something we've done. So whatever aspect about something that we're enraged about and trigger, that's what we've done. So let's say Teal is lying to people and that's what pisses me off and that she's lying to people. So I have not forgiven myself for the times that I've lied to people. And that is why that trigger is still there. Once I heal that aspect of me, it goes away. But some people don't even realize that they're doing this. So let's say like, like the PETA people, people that are enraged because why? Well, because people are hurting animals or because people are being careless. It's whatever aspect of the deed that they're doing is the way that they feel. And so if I can, if you feel that way, then you're like, oh my gosh, and you're not resolved in that feeling. Now you're enlisted in the cause of like, oh my gosh, they should never hurt animals. And so now someone who says that person hurt an animal, you can go and attack and do whatever because they're controlling you to the point that's like you get these Greenpeace terrorists. They're holding so much pain about something they did in their past or their life and and they've transmuted that and put that into this area and this function. So now they can get control to do whatever. And so it's, it's crazy. And it's the way I think we're wired for some reason. I don't know. So I, I really resonate with that. And I, and you know, any good religion has an enemy, right? They, they have to, you know, or, or a dic dictator, dictatorial regime, you know, mm -hmm. Hitler had the Jews, right? If, yeah. if you want to really gather people together make them feel shame, control them with fear and anger mm -hmm. and righteous indignation, and then have an enemy. Yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. And that's that's kind of how cults work, and that sounds like that's partly how teal worked, and that's how all sorts of dangerous things. And, and again, veganism can be a cult. Vegetarianism can be a cult. Or it can be healthy. Like, none, and, and some people can have great experiences as Mormons, mm -hmm. and some people can be abused. Like there's no like one experience for all people in any organization or in any interaction with anyone. So I, I understand that in that sense, it's complex. I do have a, um, a friend who writes, what about the victim she created by telling people they were abused or abusers that is false. So basically the people who were told their dad sexually abused them or mm -hmm. they were their, their friend satanically ritually abused them when those people ended up being falsely accused. What oh, about that harm? Okay. So again, the root of all evil is feeling bad for someone. So even though I'm smiling right now, it makes me feel like I'm being disrespectful. I'm not caring about someone. I just don't think that it's, it's kind of, if you look back on it, it can be kind of funny. Like, how could you think that you, that happened and it didn't. And it can also be like, how dare you say that? But see, that's again, if you're holding pain about what I'm saying, you're trying to make me hold pain. And you're trying to try to make me feel bad. But I, so this is the same thing. Like it's sad what they went through their personal journey. They've got to figure out how to forgive and, and get to a, a point of, of levity about their life. And, and the ways that I say that is to me, that is the highest form of like, um, embracing your past is the point that you can get to the point that you can joke about it. And I know a lot of people are like, Oh, that's okay, not so, what I want. So to hear, I, 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 you know, I've studied secular Buddhism and there's this whole idea of holding stories loosely, holding labels loosely that, that this idea of mental health, even fusion is holding labels too tightly as your identity, holding stories too tightly, letting them own you that exactly. you can become chained to victimization, stories, labels, exactly. emotions, and that weighs you down. So that there weight. is, yeah. th what are you saying? That weight, yeah. that weight is the root so, of all evil. It's so there pain. is, I, I can say there's psychological credibility in what you're saying in the sense uh -huh. that we will all be harmed if we become too enmeshed in our stories, our labels, good and bad, evil, right and wrong, because we end up being the victims. We don't live a healthy, happy life. We're always angry and fighting exactly. and warriors and wasting our life away, being bitter and angry and resentful. The, so that I'm going to acknowledge that, but I'm going to ask you to respond to the very okay. real idea, 
What if what if a daughter was estranged from her dad? What if her dad's reputation was soiled by by Teal Swan's false accusations and false memory? What if family relationships got destroyed? What if somebody even goes to jail uh-huh. for things that they didn't do? That's not like, hey, be happy and you know. I, I get what you're saying. So, and so, so respond that, to that. So again, that sucks, and that person's life that sucks. But I'm not going to go there with you. I'm not going to feel bad about it because to me, that just brings more pain. The more pain that you bring about something to get, I know. Now, the question is, what do we do to stop it? I don't have a solution. If I had a solution, and if I worked in law enforcement, if I worked in this, I'd be like, oh, we should go investigate this and shut it down. You know what I mean? I don't. My life, I'm a computer programmer. I have no idea. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a therapist. I don't know what to say to these people. I don't know what to do. And so what she's asking for is something I can't give because that's not my life path. I can just tell you. You do feel sorry. You yeah, do, I you... feel sorry. That's horrible. That's not cool. That's not you anything. You condemn it. You denounce yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's super shitty. And you acknowledge shitty. that Teal is hurting people. Yeah, exactly. Do you? Oh, well, I think that everyone can be either hurt, like I said, by the same experience. So if I, I can acknowledge that when some people leave the thing, they can be just completely hurt by it. But I know, guess what? I have family members that went through and got their, their uh, like an uncle and he got false memories during this time. And he's been away from my family and happy. I even talked to him about it all. And he does, he's just so glad not to be part of my family and like on all the families. Because if a family's toxic and it yeah, gets he, you away. yeah. So I'm trying to say is that like, it's so, it's so nuanced and so complex. It's not an easy answer. No, I don't want anyone to have anything, any problem at all, but you can go through the same experience, a torturous experience. And one person is like, wow, the Navy and buds was awesome. And another one's like, oh, that was hell. Like everyone, everyone goes through these different things. So I can't, you can't, I don't know. Yeah. There's not a and, solution. And, and all these things that I've cast questions about, whether it's Reiki or spiritual reading or tarot cards or crystals or mm-hmm. essential oils, you'll be able to find people that say they helped me. They healed me. They changed my life. And what's complicated about it is yes, they can over promise and under deliver. Yes. They can be infused with powers that aren't real and cause people to believe and do things that aren't based in reality and even cause harm, but they can also, whether it's placebo or in some cases, benign actual benefit or perceived benefit lead to people saying it changed their lives. And that's where we can't really, we can't really be in the business of, of condemning anything or exalting anything comprehensively. People are just having their experiences. And the question you're asking is, what are you going to do with it? Whatever life has dealt you. Exactly. What are you going to do with it? Exactly. Are you going to become a victim and angry and yeah. spend the rest of your life hating and trying to tear something down, which is probably only going to strengthen it. Exactly. Or are you going to figure out what your values are, figure out what kind of life you want to live, figure out how to get self-empowered. Exactly. And then build the life you want to live. And exactly. you're saying, as tragic as it may be, friend, that your dad was falsely accused, that your relationship was estranged, it's awful, it's terrible, it's egregious, and trying to tear Teal down will probably only strengthen her amongst her followers because they'll be the persecution complex. And the best thing you can do is find a therapist, find friends, find a community, find help, heal and, and live the best possible life. Well, yeah. And the exact, the question is why, why are you so angry about that? Like that person, whoever they are, they can ask why, and they can find out for themselves what they're angry about and how it's always a self-reflective mirror of an aspect of you that you haven't forgiven yourself. And you're, you can say, Oh, I've never killed someone. Okay. But what, what the thing, like if I saw someone, getting killed. I, there, I have no hostility about it. I would try to stop it for sure, but I'm not triggered inside of myself. I don't feel like an overwhelming rage about it. I'd just be trying to save their life. I try to kill the other person if they're bad or whatever. I mean, like, yes, I would act, but the things I get enraged about are the things that I personally have not accepted and healed within myself and, and, you know, feel better about. So what are some examples of that inner work? Cause again, I don't want to blame the victim in the sense that like, Okay, you were victimized by Teal Swan. Your dad was victimized by Teal Swan. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's you. It's, it's, you. It's, it's, it's you. No, I don't want to send the message to victims that that the problem was them needing to fix something inside of them. No, no, it's not. Victims. I'm saying now that it's over. Now that it's over. The, 
the anguish and pain you need to heal within you. You have to unpack the baggage. So cry, get angry, you know, get those emotions out, tap them out, whatever it takes. Tell your story. Tell your see story. A therapist, see a therapist. Write it out. Write, write your it out. Novel, yeah. Come go on Mormon go stories. On to- yeah. Go come and on talk. Mormon stories, whatever you got to do. Yeah, for real. Go tell people about it. Is go- that part of your healing? Is this story yeah. part of your healing? Oh, of course. Why? Yeah. This story is part of my healing because I've so many people I've tried to share it before. I mean, I wanted to make sure I came from a spot that I was authentic that I had improved in my life enough to the point that I could share a story without being completely nuts. And I, I don't know, I could still be, I just, I feel like now this is a huge closure to a huge part of my life. So for there. you telling the story was part of your healing because you yeah. were pretty excited to do the oh story. My gosh. But, yeah. but again, it's not because you wanted to tear down Teal Swan, no, or which Mormonism. means you're it's... not coming from a destructive place. I would like to think. You're but... coming, you want to come from a creative, positive place. Yeah. yeah Even yeah. though you feel hurt. By her. Uh, a little, but not as much because I try to look at all the pain and uh, dissect it and unplug them all little piece by piece. But now it's, I mean, it's kind of just more amusing everything that I did. Like I used to think I was a reptilian alien. We'd all be gathered around the table and they'd be so like, you learn okay. to laugh at it. Yeah. Exactly. Does, that, does that take away the power <laughs> exactly. of things exactly. by not making it the most horrible, outrageous thing exactly. ever, but just something like, I can't believe I believe that. Exactly. But you can feel, you can feel, you can feel when you're around someone who wants to get you to swallow their pain and embody it. And they because, want to take over you. Yeah. They want to control you. Yeah. They're like, how dare you? Because they're using the same tactics that they were probably brought up with or whatever. How dare you say that about my past? Well, they learned it from religion. You? They learned it from religion. Yeah. Right? yeah. But I mean, it, or their parents or passive aggressive Utah it's, culture. It's whatever also it in any, any organization yeah, yeah. and any, any movement. Yep. Any movement, any movement. And it could be politics, right? Trump, anti-Trump, yeah. Obama, anti-Obama, oh, yeah. environmentalism, How veganism, vegetarianism. If you're, if you're finding yourself motivated by hate and anger and outrage and a lot of internal fear and shame, <laughs> you know, and guilt, you, what you're saying is those wirings aren't going to lead you to a great place. But at the same time, how do you get, this is the thing I've struggled with is, is like, oh, well, how do you get motivated enough in order and powerful enough in order to do something? And I found it, it's from a space of joy. Like I was excited to do this because I wanted to. And so if you move from a space of like, Ooh, I really like, I really like programming. I think it's fun to solve technical problems and get in there. It's fun. It's I'm a little nerd in that way. So that's what I like to do. And so if you really feel passionate about like fighting for a cause and you love it, then you're going to do it and you're going to do it from a space and a place that isn't full of hostility and anger and hate. It's just a beautiful, you know, in a Southern Utah, there's a leader of uh, the, I think the Southern Utah pride organization. And I talked with her and all about all her movement. And she's like, you know what? Like, I don't want anyone to infringe on my rights and I don't, and I understand that they have their beliefs and this is what I want to do. I want to promote the safety and acceptance of these people. She had no hostility. It was such a pure movement. She really loved what she was doing and she whole, organizes events. I love her, Lisa. And, uh, why are you getting emotional? Um, because I, I start to cry uh, easily. I am very easy to cry, but I was thinking of something that she was telling with me about the Stonewall in like New York. With the, with the LGBT Yeah, and I was like LGBT. crying just thinking about it because it was just like, I never knew that what they went through. And it just, it hurts me to think that, and obviously I have a lot of pain that I'm still working on and letting go of, but um, it just hurts me to think that people are so uncomfortable being themselves in our society that they, you know, that for hundreds of years that so many people like women have been oppressed and LGBT people, LGBTQ plus all the people that have been totally just like uh, people help, of color, right? People of color. Yeah. It still continues yeah, yeah. like that poor black man that was just killed. And then the cops just had a video and just denied it. Just fucking sucks. It's like, <laughs> sorry. I just cry a lot. No, it's good. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's just so sad. It's just like... <laughs> this feels horrible because it's like... <sighs> I mean, my life has been absolute bliss. I've made a mess of it in a lot of ways, but overall, compared to everyone else that I know of, like, they've gone through so much more hell, and they're out, and they're on top, and... I mean, the... This, this guy at the gym I met the other days, I mean, I've known him for a few years, but his name is Justin. And he just, anyways, he just got out of some really hard stuff and he's just so upbeat. 
and he's got a bunch of like scars on him and I'm sure he's been through hell but the guy just keeps going on people are amazing I just I'm just so happy that people keep going and keep trying to find what works for them and I'm sorry I'm so fucking emotional it's embarrassing it's beautiful it's beautiful it's just just it's strength this is strength vulnerability is strength so thank you try to turn it off but anyways. no don't turn it off it's beautiful I just am so, so grateful that everyone out there is just trying to find what works for them. And I just don't feel obligated to do things, do things because you want to, because when you do things that you feel obligated to, you, they can always feel it. People can always feel that you're kind of resenting it. And the first way to relieve the pressure is to say it, say, I really don't want to do this, but I'm going to do it because I like you. And you start to feel better the moment you share the way that you feel. And that's just the way it always has been. And that's what the, um, oh, what's the famous guy on PBS that everyone loves? You know what I'm talking about? The PBS guy that works with kids. I've totally forgot his name. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers. That's what he wants. He, that's what he said. He said he said it in front of Congress, in front of Senate. He says, I want all children to know that feelings are mentionable and manageable. And that's the truth. Like if you, if you could just find a healthy outlet for your emotion, you can improve your life like a million fold. If you can just get vulnerable and share how you're really feeling, like just say, hey, I'm feeling upset because you're putting your shoes on your, my seat and I don't want it to get ruined. And when I was a kid, my dad got mad at me for putting shoes on the seat. So I'm doing the same thing. And I don't know if it's good or bad, but this is what I'm doing. Just, just be real with people and you'll feel a million times better and you can process things because the moment you start to get vulnerable with people, they're willing to get vulnerable with you. You've set the stage. You said, hey, I'm having a terrible day because I'm remembering a terrible event. And now all of a sudden they can get real with you. Like you're willing to share all the shit you're going through. They're willing to do it. And obviously there's issues where people are manipulating and being dramatic and like using things. And you can feel that. Someone's trying to bring you down with their pain so they can get sympathy out of you. You'll be able to notice and detect all that stuff. And you can change that within you when you do it. It's just everything's possible. I love it. I love it. And I want to, there's something a little bit nuanced or technical I want to highlight because you're saying we need to stop politicizing pain. When we act, we need to act from a place of love. Even if you're going to say, I don't agree with everything that's happened or I don't like what's going on. There's something different about doing that from a place of love and joy and happiness. It's not vindictive. It's not angry. It's not trying to destroy. It's not destructive. It's almost like creative um, critique. But you're saying come from a place of love and positivity. And what I also want to just acknowledge is something else you said, which is that anger is real. And there, there are people who are hurt who have a right to be angry. So you're not saying don't be angry. You're not saying suppress or hold back your anger. No. You're saying the opposite. You're saying you need to get it out. Get it out. So, but but that's a, but th those two things can get confused because you're saying process your anger, lean into it, vocalize it, process it, learn from it. But then you're saying move beyond the anger and learn to operate from a place of he healing and love, right? Well, I mean, you can't move beyond the anger. You have to unpack the baggage. If you try to move beyond the anger, all you're doing is literally like um, repressing it. Yeah. So you have to unpack it, however it takes. I mean, I, like I said, I gave you the technique. You sit there and that's what helps me. You ground yourself, you tap your head and you feel all the pain. You ask yourself why if you're stuck on a feeling and you just keep going. You let yourself unravel the mess that's in your mind. But the um, about people that, yeah, I mean, like get angry. Yeah. If you, whatever you feel like, wherever you're at, if you want to say someone's a horrible person and feel like, yeah, do that for as long as you need to, I guess. Like, I don't, whatever is going to, like, don't be, a, don't be a victim's victim. Meaning like, don't just let people trot all over you. Don't just let people ruin your day. Like stand up for yourself. Definitely. But if you want to figure out why someone is making you angry when you're trying to resolve it, then you can look inside like and figure out stuff about yourself. Like one thing for me that I'll be glad to do is like one, here's a process I need to get through is like, I really dislike Trump and I'm really angry at him. And I know why, because I feel really terrible about what I did when I was in singles ward. When I was in the singles ward, there was a girl 
that was sitting next to, and I scratched her back in sacrament meeting. And I felt so horrible for that. And I haven't forgiven myself for it. And I, she Why did you feel horrible for that? She didn't want me to touch her she back. She didn't ask you. She, she didn't, didn't ask me. Consent. I was, yeah, consent. yeah. I was being a pervert. I was being a disgusting person. And I've just now realized that. And that was a terrible thing. And I like to apologize to that woman. I don't even remember her, but like, I was scratching her back and she moved away and then I stopped and I just felt horrible. Like, I mean, anyways. Mm. So, yeah, and I think she said, like, she didn't, I, I think I got the message that she didn't want me to do it. But still, I still felt like, and that's, and that, so that's, and I've just realized that. And that's one of the many reasons that I don't like President Trump. And I need to resolve those issues within myself. Obviously, I'd love a, for any better president or presidential candidate, but. Okay, so you're yeah, saying you, you don't like it when people are abusive or sexually abusive or assaulting women. I don't like that in general, yeah, yeah, but like I yeah. have didn't for, I was enraged. There's a big difference between like stopping something with like, okay, this is happening. Stop, stay away from her. Like, you know, this is not going to happen. And there's a big difference between being enraged about something to the point that you're violent and you're going to jump to conclusions and not think clearly. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference. And the difference is forgiving and healing yourself as opposed to projecting it onto other people. So there's definitely a delineation where we have to stop things. We have to improve things. And there's definitely like, it's a personal problem and a world problem. There's two parts to add these things. It's not just like, you know, it's a personal problem and you should get over it. No, it's a world problem. We need to improve it. But if you're getting triggered and upset and you want to resolve that pain within you, there's a technique. If you don't, fuck, it's your life. Enjoy it. I don't care. Be angry as much as you want. It's fucking life. Some people are just angry and they're really fun to be around. It gives <laughs> shit. I know those people. They're always like talking shit and being mean and it's fun. <laughs> Who cares? That's your personality. For me, it was heavy and weighted down. So that's why I was trying to get through it. And for me, this ties back to Mormonism because there, there are post-Mormons. There are, um, you know, post-Mormon feminists. There are, you know, I have a friend that's texting me right now, and here's, here's what she wrote. She writes, in every group from conservative to liberal, every group has a light and a shadow. And the, politis, the politicization of pain is where ex-Mormons or feminists sometimes go wrong, not the expression. So you can express the pain, but politicizing the pain to control or manipulate people is where we go wrong. And I think that happens with ex-Mormons. I think ex-Mormons can get so angry. It was a fraud. The church, I, I lost all this time. I lost all this, you know, opportunity. I made all these decisions I wouldn't have made. Yes, that's all true. Yes, be angry about it. But then it, at any point, if you or others are politicizing that pain, trying to manipulate or control people and, and coming from a place not of creative love and positive energy, but from a place of anger or bitterness, you you might not achieve the healing and personal growth that you want to exactly. achieve. And your your movement may be undermined because it's sort of rooted in something that's More toxic and unhealthy and unsustainable. Exactly. Is that kind of, exactly. is that what you're feeling? Exactly. Is that what you're trying to say? Exactly. Thank yeah. you for clarifying. And so I'm sure I've made mistakes in this arena trying to help people. And so I'm learning a lot and I really appreciate it. I've got other, so I just, I'll just acknowledge publicly. So it's Diana, my friend, Diana, who uh, taught me, told me about Teal Swan and who, um, who told me to look into it just out of curiosity, if other people knew about her. And I just want to thank Diana for, uh, letting me know about this and helping to make this possible. I don't think Diana's intent was to destroy Teal Swan either. It was just basically, I think she felt he hurt, by some of the things she experienced and wanted to see if other people were getting hurt. But love you, Diana. Super grateful for uh, you helping us um, do this episode. Uh, thanks to my other friend who's been texting me, who's been giving me her uh, wisdom. She says, I love Jared, my other friend. Um, and uh, I think there's a lot of people, uh, you know, they're, they're basically saying on, on Facebook, thank you, Jared, for sharing all of this with us. I really needed it today. Your compassion is admirable. Some Lisa writes, it's beautiful and real. Jamie writes, thank you for being raw and real. The world needs more of this. Carol writes, it's so refreshing to see a guy cry. Thank you. You're doing amazing. Maddie writes, uh, thank you for being vulnerable, so powerful and a sign of strength. Proud of you. Um, and Kelly writes, never apologize for having real feelings. You are a human and you saw pain and you empathize. Uh, Diana says you're commendable. Um, it's a heartbreaking and it's an inspiring story. So thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, brother. Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm so happy to see you feeling like you're healthier and happier. Oh my gosh. Do you feel better? Oh yeah. Like you've finally started to feel, we've never arrived, but do you start feeling like you're finding the healness and the wholeness and the well-being that you were searching for all along? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, just like, just like fun little things. Like, I mean, life is just full of these little things. Like we're going to play Ticket to Ride tonight and I'm going to get my daughter and we're all going to play a fun game. And it's just like, life's amazing. Like, I don't know, just like board games and food and life and just little things that I was always trying to like get to some point in like fame and wealth and all this stuff, thinking that that's where happiness would be or anything. And it's just not there. So it's just right here, just hanging out, talking with a friend or a stranger. And you never know, just little things in life. Are you going to start a YouTube channel and become a guru? Uh, hopefully not. <laughs> yeah. Cause the power's within, right? Yeah. I mean, I was, yeah, that's pretty much all I wanted to say was that. So as long as, I mean, that's just like, I thought so long and hard about was like, what's making people miserable and how to make your life better. And to me, it's just getting your feelings and emotions out and not holding on to pain and letting things go, changing the narrative, so to speak. So I love it. And my, my dear friend summarizes it. Uh, she doesn't like to be named, uh, so I'm not going to name her. But she says, fully unpack the pain, just don't institutionalize it. <laughs> That's the way my dear friend summarizes what we've just heard. How do you like that? Do you like that summary? Wait, fully. Unpa unpack the pain. Oh, unpack. I thought I said Unpack if. the pain. Yeah. Don't institutionalize it. Yeah. What do you think? Oh, yeah. Is that a good summary? Oh, yeah. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. <laughs> so thanks, unnamed friend, for your wisdom as well. Thanks, Diana. You made this possible. Thank thanks you. all the listeners that have been tuning in. Please share this with a million people. I think this interview is an all-star interview. So many people can heal and grow from this. Our point is not to tear down Teal Swan, to alienate her followers. No, just everyone find healing and joy. Learn yeah. from this if there's That's something fun. of value. And if you like this interview, share it with a billion people and people will be healed and will be better, you know? And maybe Teal will be healthier and her followers will be healthier and will be healthier and everyone will be healthier. There we go. As a Have result a of life. this sort of thing. And, and, and what? Have a great life? <laughs> yeah. <that's> a... <laughs> yeah. All right. So thanks to everyone for tuning in today on Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm not sure how long we went, but I know I loved it and learned a lot. Please, uh, if you want to support Mormon Stories Podcast or the Open Stories Foundation, your donations are tax deductible and uh, you'll be a part of a cause. But I hope it's a cause that's never institutionalizing pain <laughs> or or uh, making people victims and, and sowing fear and self-doubt and holding ourselves up with special powers or special authority because we have none. The powers within you uh, look for intrinsic sources of power. We're just here to help you find y your best self. And so if you want to support us, uh, please do. And if you can't, just give us a positive review, Facebook or iTunes, spread the word, uh, share the love with others, um, and and just become healthy and happy yourself and live healthy, happy lives. If that's all you do, I'm thrilled. So thanks for joining us, Jared. Uh, you're awesome. Thanks for being willing to tell your story. Thank you. Good luck going back to St. George. Drive safely. Have a fun time with your daughter. Thanks. And uh, stay in touch, will you? Yeah. yeah. All right. All right, everyone, thanks so much for joining us, and we'll be covering more on this topic and others in the weeks and months and years ahead. Thanks for supporting us, and you guys take care. Love each other. Be kind. Talk soon.